Welcome everyone to the knowledge sessions. It's a series of talks and seminars about gemology fueled by our decades of research. Now at GIA, we consider ourselves fortunate to study and learn from gems. And it's our mission to share our discoveries and learnings about the world. Now, I'm excited to kick things off today. My name is Robert Weldon. I'm the director of the Richard T. Liddicote Gemological Library and Information Center here at GIA. And I'm joined by two fabulous people. I'm really honored to introduce Dr. Aaron Palkey, Senior Manager of Colored Stone and Research. Now, Dr. Palkey spends his days studying a range of topics from treatments to the geological and geographic origin of colored stones. And he focuses on ruby, sapphire, and emerald. Now, I've traveled with, with Nathan, and it was a joy to watch him in action. Now, I'm also joined by Nathan Renfro, the Senior Manager of Colored Stone Research. He studies a range of topics from treatments to the geological and geographic origin of colored stones, especially ruby, sapphire, and emerald. Now, before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. Everyone attending is automatically muted. If you have a question, please submit it using the Q&A feature that you're gonna see at the bottom of your screen there. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. There will be a Q&A session at the end where Dr. Palkey will have the opportunity to answer some of your questions and Nathan will also have that opportunity. We'll also be sending a recording of the session to you later today. And that message will also have a survey. We'd love to hear your feedback. So with that, I'm going to pass you over to Dr. Palkey and Nathan Renfro. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, thanks for the, for the introduction and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, you know, we're really happy Nathan and I get the opportunity to, today to talk about one of our favorite topics in the world of gemology, which is Montana sapphires. So on the next slide, go over a little bit about um, the various things we're going to talk about today. Montana sapphires, it's not just one thing. Um, there are several deposits in Montana that produce sapphires. There are basically four primary deposits, four deposits that have been economically worked over the years. These are Yogo Gulch, Dry Cottonwood Creek, Rock Creek, and Missouri River. We can sort of break those down even a little more further into primary deposits and secondary deposits, or basically Yogo versus everything else. So the Yogo sapphires are really distinct from these other deposits in their gemological properties and, and a lot of other properties. Um, the other deposits, the secondary deposits, and I'll talk about what this means later, secondary versus primary, but the secondary deposits, Dry Cottonwood Creek, Rock Creek, and Missouri River, these all generally share a lot of similar gemological properties and chemistry and um, geological formation conditions. So we sort of tend to uh, consider these three deposits as a, as a group, the secondary Montana sapphires. Um, there was a really interesting publication by a, a friend of ours, Dick Berg from the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. A few years back, he documented all the reported localities of corundum and sapphire in Montana. And it was a, a book like 100 pages long. They have all these really obscure and weird uh, reportings of sapphires in Montana, like somebody's backyard when they were building a porch, they found sapphires maybe, or the golf club in Butte, Montana um, has a sapphire deposit under the 18th hole or something like this. But basically there's only been really four economic deposits that have been worked over the years. So the next slide I'll show you the first topic we'll talk about, which is Yogo sapphires. So I mentioned Yogo is the primary deposit. Um, in this map, which we're showing here to kind of set the scene, Yogo is shown here, the circled in the red there. It's kind of, you have these deposits from Rock Creek to Yogo going sort of in southwest to northeast. Um, Yogo is the furthest east deposit. Now, in the next slide, I'll show you some, some of these stones. So I want to talk a little bit about the geology and the history of this deposit, but I don't want you guys to kind of get disappointed at, at not having seen stones in the first few slides. So I want to show you this to pique your interest. I'll show you some more pretty photos later too. Um, these are Yogo sapphires in the rough. This is pretty typical of what you might see for rough Yogo sapphires, although I, these are rather larger than the typical Yogo rough you would see. Um, these are probably about half an inch to an inch in diameter, relatively thin sapphires here, but these are typical, especially the color is very typical 
for the Yogo Sapphires. And we'll get to that a little later too. Now, this is a schematic geological map of the Yogo Sapphire deposit. The important thing to note here is the, the thick line running sort of horizontally across the map here. This is basically, it's called a dike. This is a geological formation called a dike. This is where all the sapphires are being mined at Yogo. Um, a dike is basically a, a formation where molten rock is injected into the earth's crust. And so you form these walls of, these vertical walls of rock where this molten rock, this magma intruded into the earth and slowly solidified and cooled. Um, and in this case, di the dike is what's being mined here for the sapphires because this molten rock, when it came from deep within the earth, it brought up these sapphires along with it. Now, in the next slide, I'll show a different uh, view of the Yogo Sapphire deposit. This is a satellite image of the Yogo Sapphire deposit. And this dashed red line, you can sort of make out where the dike, the trace of the dike along the surface of the earth here. This is where they're mining the sapphires. One other thing to note about this satellite image, uh, this doesn't look like there's a lot going on in this area, right? It's pretty out there, it's pretty far out um, in the wilderness. And the next slide will show kind of an image of that as well. This is a historic photo of the town of Utica, which is the, the closest town to the Yogo Sapphire deposit. And this sort of corroborates what we saw in the previous slide, which is there's not a whole lot going on necessarily in this town of Utica. This was taken in the early 1900s. This was Utica probably at almost the apex of its activity when it was at the most bustling that it's ever been when there was a lot of mining activity going on at Yogo. Um, but you know, it was a pretty big town probably by then. It had a hotel and a saloon and a, a general store as well. So they were doing all right at, by those standards. Um, the next slide shows another kind of historically interesting aspect of the Yogo deposit. This is the feature they call the Tollgate, or this is Tollgate Hill and the Yogo deposit. Now, Nathan and I had the opportunity to go to Yogo in, uh, in 2017. Um, a local jeweler from Bozeman had bought up the, the Vortex mine and he invited us out there to go take a look. And one of the interesting things is when you drive up to the Yoga deposit, you're driving along this road and you come to this kind of crevice between the rocks where you pass through this narrow canyon. What actually happened here, there was a guy in the, in the 1800s when, before they had sapphires here, but when this was, there was gold mining interest going on, a fellow, you couldn't actually get past this feature at that time. So a fellow came in and dynamited out the rock here allowing this road to be created, going to, the, uh, going to the river where they were panning for gold. And, um, you know, since he went to all the effort of blasting out the rock, he decided he was going to create a toll gate here. And so he charged you 50 cents per person or a dollar per wagon to cross his toll. And uh, as authority, the authority he used for collecting that toll was the, the Colt revolver that he wore on his hip. And so um, <clears throat> that was sort of part of the local flavor of the whole scene of, of Yogo back in the day. And in the next slide, showing a little bit about the actual mining at Yogo. So like I said, the Yogo dike is this vertical wall of rock that it was injected into the earth. It's maybe a meter to 10 meters wide at most. Um, and it intruded into this formation called the Mission Canyon limestone. And what you're actually seeing here, you're not seeing the dike really in these photos, you're seeing the limestone, um, but you're seeing the, the canyon where the people were mining this, the Yogo dike right out between those two walls of, of limestone. And in the next slide, I'll show a little bit more about this. So in the old days, when they were first started mining, they could do surface mining. They could take the dike out right at the surface, but eventually, because this is a, a vertical wall of rock, eventually you get to a point where you're getting so deep that it's costly and it's dangerous to continue mining in a surface operation. So eventually, as you see in the photo on the, on the right there, people had to start turning to underground mining. Started, they started digging tunnels and shafts through the, the rock in order to get at this dike to get the sapphires out. Now, uh, these are some photos of when we went to the mine in 2006-17. Um, the, on the left is the entrance to the Vortex mine. So that's, that's the local jeweler, Don Beatty, who, from Bozeman, who bought up the Vortex mine. And then you can see another photo of us actually going through the mine shaft. And in the next slide, this is a photo of the rock that they're actually mining. This is the dike rock. This is um, the host rock where you find the sapphires. And we call Yogo a primary deposit because the sapphires are being mined directly out of hard rock, directly out of the rock that the sapphires were um, found in the earth. And this rock is called a, a watchetite, which I realize may not be very meaningful to most of you guys, but you could also call it a lamprefire, which I also realize may not be super meaningful. But one thing to kind of make sense of this is, 
A lamprophyre is a volcanic rock that looks a lot like a kimberlite. And you may know that kimberlites are the rocks, the volcanic rocks that brought diamonds up to the surface. And so it, it, a lamprophyre or a watchetype was formed in many similar ways to a kimberlite. It's a magma that uh, started its life down deep within the earth and the earth's mantle. And when the mantle started heating up, it started melting slowly. And some of these melts uh, came to the earth's surface. And when they came past along the earth on their way to the surface, they picked up sapphires somewhere along the way and brought these sapphires up to the surface of the earth for us. And you'll see that in the next slide. This is I have some views of the dike that's being mined at Yogo. So this is um, underground in the vortex mine. You might rec recognize that this, these kind of um, lines of rock, this the dike that they're mining here, it looks different than the slide I just showed. Uh, this is much different colored. So the, the rock I showed previously, that's a fresh version of these lampifier. Um, it's black in color. That's what you might see when in the unaltered version of this dike. Now what they actually try to mine though is the part of the dike that's a little more weathered out. It's a little more altered by secondary hydrothermal waters coming through. So the dike that you see, the part that they're actually trying to get is more yellow to brown in color because it's been slowly weathered out and it makes it easier to get the sapphires out because this rock is a little more friable. It's a little easier to break it down. And so I promised you guys some pretty photos of Yogo sapphires. And here's a really good example. This is a rough Yogo sapphire. Um, that, what I wanna highlight here is that color. The really interesting thing and the really valuable thing about Yogo sapphires is their color. Um, Yogos essentially never need to be heat treated in order to attain that bright, brilliant, rich blue color. Um, the color of a Yogo sapphire when you get it faceted, that's the color that it came out of the ground with. Now on the next slide, I'll show you some more photos of the Yogo sapphires. The one drawback to the Yogo is the rough tends to be a little bit tabular, flat in nature. And the problem with this is that this means that in order to get a well-proportioned stone, you can't use the whole surface area of that rough. You have to kind of, if you want to get a well-proportioned stone, in a lot of cases, you have to sacrifice size. Or in other, in the other option is that if you want to get a large stone with a, a flat tabular rough, you oftentimes have to sacrifice um, windowing. You have to let the stone be windowed a little bit. Still, there are many, uh, many well-proportioned blue sapphires coming out of Yogo. Uh, they tend to be a little smaller, Stones over one carat are actually really, really rare at Yogo, but you do see them from time to time. And on the next slide, some more examples of the Yogo sapphires. Now, the rich blue cornflower color that you see in, the, in most Yogos, that's the typical color you see. Um, maybe 90% of the rough is this rich blue cornflower color, but you do get this gradational change in color from blues to violets to purples to even the rare red rubies. Um, the rubies are extremely rare, but you do see purples and, and um, violets from time to time. One other thing to mention about yogos is, and I'll get this a little later with the secondary deposits, one of the main purposes or one of the big purposes initially with the yogo sapphires was not only as gemstones but also as an industrial product. They were used as, as watch bearings um, or, or bearings for other instruments as well. And it's an important part of the history here but we'll talk about that more with the secondary Montana sapphires. I think that's where I'm going next with the next slide. Um, so Next, we'll turn to the secondary deposits, Missouri River, Rock Creek, and Dry Cottonwood Creek. And those deposits are shown here um, on the, the three westernmost deposits shown here. We're not gonna talk too much about Dry Cottonwood Creek. It was mined economically in, in the early days, but in recent times, there hasn't been a lot of activity at Dry Cottonwood Creek. So we'll focus mostly on Rock Creek and Missouri River in the next slides. One thing to mention about the secondary deposits, or a few things to mention. Um, <clears throat> that make them different from Yogo. One thing is that they are available in a wider variety of colors. Yogo is blue to purple, violet, maybe rare reds, but the secondary sapphires in Montana have a rich variety of colors from you know, blues and yellows and greens and pinks and everything else. Now, the one thing that also stands out is the secondary sapphires often have to be heat treated to improve their color and transparency. You do get a lot of untreated stones that can be cut into gems from these deposits, but they're more rare than you see at Yogo. And a lot of, to make these mines work, you often need heat, treat, heat treatment. And like I said earlier, all three of these deposits have generally similar chemistry and inclusions and gemological properties. So we're gonna consider them all together um, as one basic group. Now, 
here are some examples of some of these secondary Montana sapphires. Like I said, you have this rich, wide variety of colors, this huge diversity of color in the Mont secondary Montana sapphires from yellows, oranges, pinks, blues, greens, even the rare red rubies. And I'll show you an example of the red ruby on the next slide. So this was actually an interesting stone. It was a stone that was sent in to us in the lab for an origin report. And it was color graded as a ruby. And this threw us off a little bit because the, the inclusions in the chemistry looked a lot like a Montana sapphire. Only we weren't too familiar with Montana rubies coming out of these deposits. And so we went to our reference collection. We had been to the mines several years back and we had a bunch of reference stones that we were able to compare this ruby against, look at their inclusions and their chemistry and everything else. And we were able to confidently uh, give an origin report as a Montana ruby for this stone um, shown in the center there. And after that, um, a, a good friend of ours, Jeff Hapeman from Earth's Treasury, he works very closely with this, these guys, the Potentate Mining Corporation, who are mining at Rock Creek. And he's got a good relationship with them. So he was able to accumulate this really stunning collection of Montana rubies. These are all from Rock Creek. But these are is maybe one of the most rare uh, collections of, of rubies you might ever see. Um, <clears throat> These are all relatively small stones, but I think the, the biggest one is a little bit over a half carat, um, but it's really amazing that anyone would, a, would be able to accumulate this amount of rubies from these Rock Creek deposits because these stones are so rare, but you do get them from time to time. Now, the next slides, I wanna talk a little bit about history. And to talk about the history of these deposits, uh, you have to talk about gold because Montana being a Western state, the history of Montana is, was started out with gold. And some of these original miners, the original prospectors who came to Montana looking for gold, you know, they weren't really mineralogists and they weren't gemologists. They didn't have a good knowledge about what the minerals were they were looking for. They were mostly just um, guys with hard wills and strong backs who didn't mind digging in the dirt for 12 hours a day. Now, the thing is though, at some of these deposits, some of these creeks they were mining through and looking through the gravels for gold, they ended up finding these shiny blue pebbles as well. And the first, the first place they found it was at Missouri River, but um, they didn't really know what to make of these stones at first. Um, and so eventually they, they took some of these stones and sent them off to jewelers and gemologists and other places and they were identified as sapphires. And one of the other parts of the history of these, these deposits, especially the secondary deposits, is that initially the sapphires started being mining on their own, not just that for the gold, but for the sapphires. And they weren't used initially as gemstones really. So some of the colors of these stones untreated are not super um, desirable in the gemstone market at that time. The gemstone market wanted sapphires to be rich blue and not these pastel colors and these other uh, fancy color sapphires. And so initially there wasn't a whole lot of interest for these stones as gemstones, but they were really valuable as an industrial product, as watch bearings essentially. And because sapphire is so hard, it's perfect for use as bearings in these watches. You have these gears spinning around 24 hours a day um, <clears throat> that need to be very highly resi resistant to abrasion. And so initially these sapphires being mined in huge quantities, hundreds of tons of sapphires were produced over the years to be used as watch bearings. And this is an example of a fellow from the Sapphire Gallery um, was in Montana, was able to, to get these stones from an, an, an auction. Um, really, you, you might, not, might not ever see these types of bearings again. Um, it's really interesting. It's kind of this really special slice of history to see these watch bearings, because um, this is, one of the main reasons these deposits were being mined at all in, in the early days. Um, they were mined from kind of the late 1800s to the maybe the 1930s and starting the 1930s um, lab-grown sapphires, the technology around lab-grown sapphires started becoming more profitable. It became easier to grow lab-grown sapphires and so eventually these natural sapphires from Montana um, had a lot of competition from the lab-grown sapphires and so this really hurt the mining in Montana for sapphires and most of the mining activities ceased until kind of the, the late 1900s um, when heat treatment became, came around. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we'll start looking at the, some of the deposits first individually after this. So the first deposit we'll talk about is Missouri River. So this is actually, it's the Missouri River, but it's kind of a stretch of the Missouri River, maybe 15 miles long near the capital city of Helena. And they're not mining strictly in the river itself, but they're mining these gravel bars that sit along the banks of the river um, there are, we call them bars, essentially. So there are several bars along the Missouri River where they're getting these sapphires. The most important ones are El Dorado Bar, Dana's Bar, um, the Spokane Bar, the French Bar. Um, and so in the next slides, we'll show you kind of what's going on here. 
uh, like I said, these currently they're mining along the bars, but in some of the initial days, when they were mining more for gold than for sapphires, they had these, these big dredging operations along the Missouri River. This was a uh, dredging operation run by the Perry Schroeder Company. Um, and what they were doing was they were just pulling gravel and sand and everything from the, from the bed of the river. And it had this big floating operation that was moving along the river. And they would take the gravels into this big floating building where the sapphires would be separated from the gravel by density. And then they would return all the rest of the gravel uh, minus the gold and the sapphires put all that back in the river and then they would keep going. And this is actually a really interesting operation. Um, it's one of the few gold mining operations that was allowed to operate during World War II. So like I said, a lot of the mining stopped around 1930 when the lab-grown sapphires started competing with the natural sapphires for the wash bearing market. But during World War II, uh, most of those lab-grown sapphires were grown in, in Europe. So during World War II, we had this shortage of industrial corundum in the US and so, um, a lot of the gold mines, or almost all the gold mines in the country had been closed down because they wanted those workers to be focusing on more strategic minerals. But uh, certain operations like this were allowed to continue mining gold. This was more of a gold mining operation than sapphires, but they were producing sapphires as a byproduct. So they were allowed to continue mining because they, the corundum and the sapphires were considered a strategic resource at that time. And so this mining operation was actually allowed to continue into, until about 1947, when they eventually stopped mining gold and sapphires along the Missouri River. Now, what you'll see in the next slide is um, an example of what the guys are mining now for the sapphires. So this is now, the operations have been moved up onto the bars on the banks of the river now. This is sort of what you might be seeing in one of these deposits. This is at the El Dorado bar. What you see is kind of several meters of dirt in, sitting on top bedrock. The first few meters are gravels. Um, this is the sapphire bearing gravel. This, the sapphires mixed up with other hard rocks, other big pieces of rock. On top of that, you have a couple meters of overburden probably, um, but this, the pay dirt is the few, first few meters of dirt that you're seeing right on top of the bedrock. And the next slides will show kind of the mining operations, what this looks like. So basically you get in there, you take all that gravel out. The first step is to put it through a grizzly. That's shown on the left there. A grizzly is basically just a big screen where you screen out all the oversized rocks, all the big boulders, and then whatever passes through the grizzly, is small enough that it might be containing some sapphires. So then you take whatever's passed through the grizzly and put it through these washing operations where you basically, you put the, the, the remaining gravel through the trommels and through jigs to separate the sapphires from the rest of the gravel by density. The, the sapphires are more dense than the rest of the minerals that you might see in the gravels like quartz and feldspars and those sorts of things. So you can separate them gravitationally. Um, and then in the next slides, we'll see what you actually get once you wash these gravels. So this is kind of at the end of a long day's work when you've washed a bunch of gravel, you go through the jigs and you look through all the pieces of gravel and you look for those little shiny blue pebbles staring out at you. And that's shown on the left, on, on the left and, and on the right are the actual sapphires that you see at the jigs at the end of the day. Now the deposit, the next slide, um, we'll talk about the other deposit, Rock Creek, which is further to the west. It's near the town of Phillipsburg. Um, in this case, they're not actually mining in Rock Creek either. They're mining all these goalies that kind of creep up into the mountain rising above Rock Creek. And these gullies are essentially, um, when the mountain itself has been weathered away, it's washing into these gullies and the sapphires that have been washed away from the mountain are getting accumulated in these gullies, these kind of ephemeral streams um, <clears throat> where the, the guys are actually mining to this day. And the next slide shows a, a satellite image of the Rock Creek area. And if you advance one, you see this same diagram from the previous slide overlaid on this satellite image, you can see all these gullies creeping up the mountain. And so you can imagine the mountains being washed away into these gullies and accumulating sapphires over long periods of time. And now you go through the gravels and pick out the sapphires these to the, uh, this day. So the next slide shows an example of what they're actually mining. And so this actually looks sort of different from the Missouri River deposit. Um, this is actually, it doesn't look like such a well-sorted gravel bed. Basically this is, it looks like a big chaotic turbulent mess. So this was probably not so much um, an alluvial deposit where the river has been kind of grading the gravels over several years. But we think this is more like a mass wasting deposit, like a big landslide or mud flow from these volcanic events that brought the sapphires to the surface. So still, they treat this deposit in much the same way as they do at Missouri River. They take these gravels and on the next slide will show us the washing operation at Rock Creek. Um, this is a big operation that's, that's being mined by a company called Potentate Mining Corporation. Um, they bought up pretty much all of the gem 
gem bearing gravels, the gem bearing areas around this mountain. And they're currently producing tons of these sapphires for the, for the world market. Um, but their operation is pretty similar. So you take these gravels, you separate them gravitationally, return the gravels back to the earth and take your sapphires. In the next slide, you'll see some of the pro product from this mining operation. On the left, you see a, a big handful of these sapphires that were picked out of the jigs after a long day of mining. And on the right, an important photo, this is showing a pan with some sapphires. And if you see at the top of the pan, that's actually some gold. So while the major focus these days in these areas is sapphires, um, they are still producing a little bit of gold as a byproduct of the sapphire mining. And it's actually really important for these, for these mining operations because it kind of covers a lot of the overhead cost. That little bit of gold they're getting covers a lot of their overhead costs and allows them to, to produce the sapphires more profitably. So on the next slide, we'll talk about one of the major advances in recent history with Montana sapphires. So um, like I mentioned, the, the mining activities in, in Montana for sapphires kind of stopped in large part around the 1930s. Yogo continued for a, a, a few years on and off, um, but Rock Creek and Missouri River pretty much slowed down a lot after 1930 when they weren't needed so much as watch bearings. And this kind of continued until maybe the late 1900s, that's 1970s, 1980s, when people started realizing you could take this rough, these sort of undesirable colors and turn them more into more desirable gemstones by heat treating them at high temperature. So you could take rough on the left and of this photo here, um, which is showing some untreated rough from these deposits. And you can take stones like that and turn them into stones on the right, these rich vivid blue colors by heat treating them, making these, these, uh, these stones much more desirable for the world gem market. So another example on the next slide, these are two faceted stones. And actually I wanna make the case also that the untreated sapphires are not always undesirable. In some cases, there's a big market for these untreated stones. Some people like these colors, these more pastel colors, subdued colors, a little more than those rich blue colors on the heated stones. There are some really fabulous examples of untreated uh, stones from Rock Creek and Missouri River um, that are really just beautiful stones. However, you could take those stones and heat treat them in most cases to get these rich vivid blue colors. And while there's a market for those untreated stones, uh, a lot of the gem market wants their sapphires rich and vivid and blue. So the heat treatment allowed them to take all this rough that they couldn't use before, heat treat it, and now turn it into a marketable gemstone that has made these deposits much more economically interesting and allowed them to, these mining operations to come in and start mining on large scales again. So on the next slide, I'll show you kind of a little bit about what's going on there. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because Nathan's gonna to touch on this more in his microscopy section. But basically what's going on is you take these sapphires, on the left is a, a slice, a slice of a Montana sapphire. It's been polished on two sides so you can see through the stone and see what's going on. All those brown areas, those are little infusions of rutile, little rutile needles all, all gone throughout, throughout the sapphire. And what happens when you heat treat it, you take those rutile inclusions and you dissolve them into the corundum lattice. You dissolve them into the crystal lattice, introducing titanium atoms into the crystal lattice, which can form pairs with iron atoms that are already there. And you can form these iron titanium pairs, which causes a blue color. So all those blue colors on the right photograph, those are little areas where the rutile is dissolved into the lattice and created this rich blue color. And so that's, this is the basic fundamental pr principle of what's going on with the heat treatment of these sapphires. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nathan because I think he's got some good examples of that later. But he's gonna talk about the microscopic features of these sapphires. All right, thanks, Aaron. So the, the microscopic features, you know, these are the things that are important for the gemologists so that they can recognize when they have uh, sapphires from, from Montana, either secondary deposit or primary source. So first we'll just go over the microscopic features from the secondary deposits, which includes Missouri River, Rock Creek, and Dry Cottonwood Creek. As Aaron mentioned, a lot of these uh, sapphires from these deposits uh, the microscopic features are pretty similar, so a lot of times you can't really tell which particular deposit it's from, but they at least are consistent with a secondary deposit from Montana. Um, another interesting thing to, to point out is that a lot of the rough that Aaron showed, you'll notice that it's kind of uh, rounded in shape and so, and because they're from a secondary source, some people get the impression that these are rounded from uh, tumbling action in a, as a tra as a, from water transport. But a lot of these crystals are rounded just um, by being resorbed into the parent magma that they form in as they're transported to the surface. 
And so there's still a lot of pristine etching and things like that on the surface of these stones, as you can see in the in the photo here, uh, which is the, the surface of a, there's no, there's no damage or anything. This is what the natural surface of, of one of these sapphires can look like using a specialized microscopy technique called differential interference contrast. And here's another image. Um, this is looking along the basal plane of, of one of these sapphires. Uh, I think this one is from El Dorado Bar, or may, maybe it's from Rock Creek. Uh, but either way, they both look pretty similar in the microscope. Um, but what you see is you see this kind of nicely etched surface and there's no, you know, rounding or abrasion to speak of from, from transport in water. Uh, here's another example. Uh, corundum is a trigonal mineral. So often we, when we look um, perpendicular to the C axis, we see the trigonal symmetry of the corundum crystal itself in these sort of uh, etched triangular shapes that we, we can call trigons. Um, Often when we um, look at these Montana sapphires from secondary sources, they, they generally have quite a lot of rutile silk in them. And so this, this second phase in the corundum is just, you know, they, it can often have these kind of rainbow iridescent colors. Uh, and you'll notice that the silk is oriented in kind of three, three basic directions. So it's crystallographically aligned to the host corundum. Um, but silk is a pretty common feature in sapphires from secondary source. And that's really important because that's, this, that's what you need in your sapphire so that when you heat it, the silk gets dissolved into the sapphire and pairs with the iron uh, so that you have iron titanium pairs, which produces the blue color. Here's another example of silk. You often have these kind of intricate zone um, densities of silk. So the core might have some really dense areas of silk and then it may become sparse as you go throughout the stone. So it's not uncommon to have this really super zone layers and, and uh, rings almost like the tree, like tree rings uh, of silk in your secondary Montana sapphires. Uh, this is actually an interesting stone here. This, is, this uh, is a pink sapphire from El Dorado Bar and it has so much silk that it's actually um, a star stone. So the stone is cut into a cabochon and it, it will actually show some, some weak asterism because there's so much silk. Uh, there's some other dark inclusions in there that are probably metal sulfides. These are common in inclusions in secondary Montana sapphires, and these are um, negative crystals at the very core, which are probably filled with a glassy melt in most cases. And you have these, uh, these are what we would call a decrepitation halo, where the, the core negative crystal has ruptured and the contents have spilled out into, into this fracture that's parallel to the basal plane. And, and then over time, that fracture is partly rehealed, and so you get this kind of netted appearance and the dark areas are where the sapphire is healed. And then the colorful areas, that's where using an oblique fiber optic source, you get thin film interference colors. And these kind of features are pretty common in, in these secondary Montana sapphires. These, this is a close up shot of the, what these negative crystals look like. And they can be filled with uh, uh, glassy melt. And if you see the glassy melt, you might even see a contraction bubble in this kind of colorless melt, which we'll see a couple images of that. And then sometimes they're filled with whitish solid minerals as well. So you'll notice all these have these kind of equatorial halos around them where, where they've ruptured. Here's an example of a, of a rutile crystal. So we have a couple of types of rutile in this stone. We have the rutile silk, which is aligned to the corundum host. And it's usually in the form of these elongated needles or this kind of particulate, what we might call dust. But then we also have orange crystals or brown crystals of, that are kind of rounded in shape and irregular. And these are protogenetic crystals of rutile. And what that means is that the, the rutile is present um, before the sapphire and then when it when it as it was incorporated into the host it was preserved in there but uh, we can tell that the root teal is protogenetic because of the rounded shape and that rounded shape suggests it was in the growth environment for a long time and so all the sharp edges of the crystal um, were dissolved away over time before it was incorporated into the sapphire here's another example of these kind of orangey 
or sometimes brownish crystals of rutile, these protogenetic rutile crystals. And then also you have the fine kind of glittery particles and needles of rutile. And all these things can contribute to the blue color when you heat a Montana sapphire. Here's an example of uh, sort of dark brown rutile crystals, uh, protogenetic rutile, and also some of this fine rutile dust and, and silk in a, in a sapphire and an unheated stone. And when you heat these, what you do, you, the, the rutile is made out of titanium dioxide, both in both cases for the silk and the protogenetic crystals here. And so when you heat these stones at high temperature, you dissolve that titanium into, from the rutile into the crystal lattice of the corundum. And you create these little localized areas of blue color. And, and, and when we see this kind of blue color in close relationship to the rutile, either the protogenetic rutile or the rutile silk, you get this kind of spotty um, blue color, which um, John Coyble had, had coined the term uh, internal diffusion. So we have this internal diffusion of blue color, not to be confused with diffusion from the external source of titanium, which you would see on the surface of the stone. But this is what you get when you have this internal diffusion from, of titanium from the, the source of titanium that's already present in the stone. So we're basically just redistributing the chemistry of that sapphire to modify the color. And that's how we get um, uh, Montana sapphires that instead of being a sort of Coke bottle green color, they're now can be this vibrant blue. Here's a couple, a couple examples of that. So these are the protogenetic root tills where you have these really significant blue halos, uh, this kind of ink spot look. Uh, so this kind of, when you have a lot of these protogenetic root tills, you can get kind of an uneven spotty, color, which may not be quite as desirable as, the, as when you have internal diffusion around uh, root tail silk, which tends to give you a little bit more of a uniform distribution of the blue color. Uh, this is one of the few inclusions that seem to be specific to one of the secondary deposits. Uh, these are, uh, this is a pretty large garnet crystal. And so far, we generally see these garnets in, from the deposit in Dry Cottonwood Creek. And we don't really see these type of garnets in um, Missouri, uh, Missouri River or Rock Creek so far. So you may see garnets. Here's another example up in the, in the top left corner. There's a, a couple of small garnets. And in the lower right corner, what we have is a, a metal sulfide inclusion. Uh, so generally iron sulfide mineral, and there's usually a few different phases of iron sulfides in there. But you can have iron sulfides in um, in all three, Rock Creek, Missouri River, and um, Dry Cottonwood Creek deposits. Here's an example of metal sulfides uh, from Rock Creek. So same kind of thing. These are usually uh, really dark, and, and in the case of these, you, the metal sulfide was confined to this sort of core crystal, and then um, sometimes in the ground, the, the core crystal is molten and ruptures, and then the contents the, of the core metal sulfide crystal kind of spill out into this fracture, leaving this kind of large dark stain in the, in the crack. This is a crystal of uh, clinozoocyte, and this is uh, regularly seen in, in sapphires from these secondary deposits. You can also see a little bit of these um, sort of this halo of these colorful platy looking things. These are, this is sort of an equatorial thin film of uh, fluid inclusions surrounding that Clinozoocyte crystal. Uh, this is a sort of a strange inclusion that Aaron and I kind of were looking into. And we've only seen this particular inclusion in sapphires from um, the Missouri River. And it's dominantly composed of, of mica, which is sort of that kind of yellowish brown color. Uh, but there's another phase in there, which is sort of the really dark green, which is spinel. And so we've seen a few of these inclusions where uh, you have this sort of uh, trapping mechanism that traps sort of a, a melt and then it exolves into these separate phases with the spinel and the mica. This is a, a good example of internal diffusion from root tail silk. And so this kind of spotty color pattern, you can almost see that it has this sort of hexagonal banded outline. And what, when you see this kind of spotty color, you have diagnostic proof that your stone's been heat treated, and which is, you know, as a result of this internal diffusion that you see from the root tail silk. Uh, 
Another example of this spotted color is pretty clear in this photo here. And then you also have a lot of these negative crystals that are filled with this glassy melt. Now the glassy melt in, in this case isn't really so diagnostic of heat treatment because you can have similar looking features in an unheated stone. Uh, but in this case, this is a heated stone, which is proof by the, uh, by the spotty color. So that was basically the rundown of the kinds of features you see in the secondary deposits. So now we'll move on to the, the sapphires from Yogo Gulch. Again, we'll look at the surfaces in using differential interference contrast. And so what you see immediately in this stone is that uh, there's, you know, the, the, the surfaces are very sharp edged and uh, that's consistent with this being a primary deposit. There was no uh, abrasive action from transport either, you know, by gravity or by water. And so uh, Yogo sapphires are really nice because they have these really pristine, perfect surfaces, um, which, which can show some interesting features. Again, because of the trigonal symmetry in the sapphire, when you're looking uh, perpendicular to the C axis of the crystal, you'll see the triangular, the trigonal symmetry uh, expressed as these sort of triangular edge features that we call trigons. Here's another example, just sort of a, a stepped face with a multitude of these little minuscule tiny trigons and a few larger trigons. These are, these are pretty common inclusions in Yogo sapphires when you do have inclusions. Now one thing to keep in mind is that Yogo sapphires for the most part are exceptionally clean. Um, that's not to say that you won't occasionally find some inclusions, but um, one of the really kind of um, hallmark features of a Yogo Sapphire is that there's often just not anything in there. And so that's another factor that aside from the, the, the nice blue color to purple color that doesn't require heat treatment is they, they often have really exceptional clarity uh, because there's, there's no, often no inclusions. But um, this negative crystal here is filled with analcyme and carbonate um, minerals. And so uh, using a little bit different light here, we sort of see that there's a core whitish component and then sort of a, a rind of, a, of a, diff a different mineral. So this is a calcite core with an analcyme rind in this negative crystal here. And just like we saw in dry cottonwood creek, yogo sapphires can also have garnets, um, which is kind of interesting. They're kind of a unique chemistry garnet, they're a mixture of uh, pyrope, almondine, and grossular. So not really a combination of garnet chemistry that you would see in a, in a gem facetable garnet. Here's another example of one of these garnets in a Yogo sapphire, a little bit bigger one, so it's got a little bit deeper orangey color. These are apatite crystals, and just like we talked about the rounded shape of the rutils in the secondary Montana sapphires, the rounded shape of these apatite crystals also tells us that these are protogenetic crystals, meaning that they existed before the sapphire did. And, and then the, the sharp edges of that apatite was rounded away before it was incorporated as an inclusion in the sapphire. And then also commonly using reflected light at an oblique angle, you'll see these sort of equatorial thin films where perhaps you have a little bit of fluid interface and sort of a crack that had been healed. And so the, you'll see these sort of little hexagonal holes in this film, uh, which is just from, from healing. So another similar looking inclusion, these, while these rounded colorless crystals are kind of nondescript and they look very much like the appetites in the previous slide, these are actually feldspar crystals. Um, but again, they have this sort of equatorial thin film. Uh, but this is not using the same kind of lighting, so no reflected light here, so you don't see those kind of inner uh, bright colorful interference colors. Here's another example of protogenetic rutil, and so you can have these kind of rounded dark crystals of rutil in Yogo sapphires as well as the secondary deposits, uh, but since they don't need heat treatment, you're not going to see um, the blue spotty color around sapphires in, from Yogo as a general rule, but they do have, they do tend to have these tension cracks with these healed fringes, and while this, these features might look like something that would be suspicious for heating. These are completely natural and in no means is the tension crack with the healed fringe an indication that the stone's seen heat treatment at all. The, the rutil crystals, the protogenetic rutil can also have this sort of dark olive greenish cast to it as well as the, the dark brown. And they can also, 
form these kind of elongate rod shapes, which is kind of uh, interesting. I don't think I've quite seen this shape of root teal in secondary source Montana sapphires, uh, but it's not that uncommon when you do have root teal present to have these sort of elongate rod shaped root teal inclusions. And by virtue of it being sapphire, um, twinning is not necessarily uncommon in Montana sapphire. And so what we have here is a couple of directions of polysynthetic twinning. And at the intersection of the twin planes, you have these sort of etch tubes or dissolution tubes, which are these sort of diagonal looking dark needle-like structures that uh, they, they mark where you have a high amount of defects where the twin planes intersect. Now, all the inclusions that we've shown up until here have, have shown you what is common to Montana sapphire or to Yogo sapphires and secondary sources. But this photo is unique because this is a, a photo showing um, rutile silk in a Yogo sapphire, which as a general rule is exceedingly rare. I've probably only seen two or three examples ever of actual rutile silk in a Yogo sapphire. So if you, if you do have a lot of needle-like silk in your sapphire, it's highly likely that it's not from Yogo. However, it's not impossible either. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're examining the, um, the sapphires in your microscope that if you do have silk, good chance it's not from the Yogo deposit. All right, and that's all of the, the kind of microscopic tour for sapphires from, from Montana. Now we're on to the uh, Q&A session, so I'll turn it back over to Robert. Okay, well, thank you guys. That was just absolutely stunning. First of all, the, the, the pictures that we saw and, and being able to sort of take a, a trip, not only through history, but uh, right there to the source was just amazing. And really understanding the difference between Yogo and and the alluvial um, deposits is really very helpful. And, you know, there were a lot of questions. So I've selected a few of those here. Uh, Frank Clark uh, asks, in which direction are these tabular stones usually cut? And I'm assuming that he's uh, referring to the Yogo sapphires. So, so generally they would be cut so the, the, the table facet is is parallel to the tabular face. So that would basically leave the C axis or the optic axis running perpendicular to the table. So that's gonna be your, your general rule. However, you know, if you, it is possible you can get some irregularly shaped rough and then you may have to modify the cutting orientation for the greatest yield. So again, generally, Table facets going to be perpendicular to the C-axis, but not always. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, Adolfo de Basilio uh, is asking why the primary deposit is just blue uh, colors that you see, and then the secondary deposit has such a great variety of colors. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not. I'm not sure we know. I'm not sure we know exactly the answer, and it it might be because. There's the primary deposit is one dike. And so there's probably one genetic event that led to the formation of the Yogo sapphires. Now at Missouri River and Rock Creek, we haven't found all the bedrock sources yet. We have found a couple of bedrock sources at Missouri River, but there are probably multiple bedrock sources in those places. There may have been multiple volcanic events that were responsible for bringing those sapphires to the earth. And because there might've been multiple volcanic events, there might have been multiple stages of sapphire formation um, that would have caused these differences in the colors by varying slightly different conditions of formation for the sapphires there. Okay. And, you know, along those lines, there's uh, this question here. Uh, it has more to do with uh, uh, color zoning and banding. Um, can you talk about the differences between color zoning and banding between the sapphires from Yogo and those from uh, other deposits? Sure, so um, uh, between sapphires from Yogo and other deposits, so in, in Yogo, Yogo is kind of a unique situation for color banding and color zoning. So the blue color in Yogo sapphires is extremely homogeneous, meaning that if you look at the stone in immersion, it just looks like a sheet of blue color 
with very little zoning at all, really. In the purple stones, you do see a little bit of zoning from, uh, you know, as the, as you add chromium into the to the blue sapphire, you contribute a pink color, which mixes with the blue to give you the red. And so the chromium is not always quite so homogeneous. And so you see some banding in the in the Yogo sapphires in the purples. The the secondary deposit Montanas, you those are generally common to to be zoned, but um, you may not see the zoning so much because the colors themselves are rather pale. Uh, one of the other interesting things about the secondary deposits from Montana is they often have these sort of uh, yellowish cores. Um, and so, so the, the zoning itself tends to be different in both cases compared to the traditional um, zoning that you would see in sapphires from say Sri Lanka, which would be sort of, it would be common to have alternating colorless and blue zones and stones from, you know, Burma, Sri Lanka, Madagascar, and so on. Okay, okay. We got a question from Clayton Oberquell, and he says hello from Montana, and he notes that it's his birthday today. Bravo and happy birthday. Uh, he says it's a very fun session. He's really enjoying it. Uh, his question, though, is uh, how you've heard that Rock Creek sapphires respond to heat treatment better than Missouri sapphires. Now, why is that? Is there more rutile in the Rock Creek sapphires? That's probably part of it. So I think that's, that may be true in general. Like if you take a, a big parcel of Rock Creek sapphires and compare it to a big parcel of Missouri River sapphires, typical mine runs, you might get more um, favorable product from the Rock Creek parcel. And I think that's, I think he's probably right. The Rock Creek can have, can tend to have more rutile inclusions in it. It can have denser particle, rutile particles sometimes. Um, there's, of course, overlap between those two deposits in that case, but you might tend to see more rutile inclusions, denser rutile clouds in the Rock Creek. Is that your experience, Nathan? Yeah, in general, you know, you know, there's, there's no hard line there. So there's, as you pointed out, you know, there's a lot of overlap. So you can certainly have stones from, you know, Missouri River that are dry Cottonwood Creek that heat really well. But, you know, if you look at a larger sample of the stones, it might be that, you know, a higher percentage might turn a nice blue in Rock Creek versus the other deposits. Um, but, you know, it, a, a lot of the deposits, you know, you know, a lot of the stones can produce really nice results either way, though. And that's, that's one of the reasons why Dry Cottonwood Creek is not as important these days. And actually, the Dry Cottonwood Creek sapphires tend to have less rutile inclusions than the other ones. And that there was a company trying to mine the, the dry cottonwood creek sapphires, what, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, and it wasn't, they realized that they couldn't heat the, those stones as well as the other deposits. So they kind of stopped. Right. Mining. Uh, there are a lot of questions about the heating temperatures. I mean, what, what temperatures are needed to heat these? So um, there's the basic one around what temperature do they need to be heated to and also uh, just an addendum to one of the questions was, I thought the heating of sapphires went back hundreds of years, so, but you mentioned the 1930s, so please clarify. So, so the, the heating temperature for Montana sapphires is generally in the order of 15 to 1600 degrees Celsius. Um, so and while sapphires have been heated for hundreds of years, it wasn't until I think it was in the early 90s the, the recipe for heating Montana sapphire specifically came about um, from the work of John Emmett, um, who who's basically unraveled the secret recipe for how to produce a nice blue color in sapphires from Montana from these secondary sources. Okay. And then uh, Barb Dutro uh, asked a question. Uh, she said, what is the temperature required for the diffusion of titanium into sapphire? Um, I think it's probably on the order of 1500 degrees Celsius, which is why that's the temperature to heat it at. At least that's the temperature required to get titanium to diffuse at a reasonable rate so that you don't have to run your furnace for hundreds and hundreds of hours. Does that sound correct to you, Aaron? Yeah, I think we've done some experiments, not with Montana sapphires, but other sapphires. Around, around 12, 1300, you can start getting some internal diffusion from the rutile, but like Nathan said, it's it's going to be much slower at those temperatures, so it'll take 
too too long to be practical. So yeah, fifteen hundred is the practical range where you'd want it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to give you a sort of a, a double whammy here uh, from Jin Zhang. We asked this. He asked this question: uh, How do you tell the ident how do you ID the crystals inside of the stones, the included crystals? And then he all and then someone else also wanted to know Nathan. Are the colors we're seeing in your pictures real? Uh, good question. So, um, so how we identify inclusions? Um, generally, the inclusions that you saw in in the photos that we have mentioned what they are. Uh, we use a, a system called a called a laser Raman microspectrometer, which is basically a laser that's attached to a microscope, so we can focus the laser beam and target an inclusion, and then we shine the laser laser from, from a specific wavelength on the inclusion. The light travels back through the microscope to a detector where we measure the Raman shift. And then when we measure that Raman shift, we can compare that spectrum, that Raman spectrum that's produced to a database of known minerals and match the inclusion identity uh, using that technique. And so, okay. so that's the, how we do the inclusion ID. Now for the colors uh, in the images, I assume that the question is geared more towards the surface inclusions. And so the colors you see are, it's, it's what we would probably call a false color image, but that's, re that's the real color that you see while looking through the microscope. And that technique, differential interference contrast, uses some specialized hardware in your microscope called a Namarsky modified elastin prism. And, and what that does is it, it's a way to control the light um, which causes the light to interfere and you get an interference color based on the distance that the, that the light travels. So when you have this sort of irregular topography on the surface of your crystal, the light's traveling it different, it's got uh, a different path length in adjacent areas. So you get a contrasting color uh, in those in relief areas. And so that's really the color that you see when using this type of microscope, but it's not really the color that the sample is. Okay, doc. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to say, I, I agree with so many of the comments here that those, that all of your pictures there have been so spectacular, really just amazing. A few of those are errands too, so. Oh, well, a couple of those. Errands <laughs> coming along just fine too. Just gorgeous. I mean, I could hang any of those on my walls here. Just beautiful, beautiful. Um, I think we have room for one last question and it's an interesting one. I thought, um, do Montana rubies vary? Do they have similar properties to Myanmar slash Burma rubies? And um, can you designate them as pigeon blood red uh, in that terminology or are they distinctive to Burma rubies? They're, they're quite different from Burmese rubies. And so the last part of that question we could address is, um, about the pigeon blood. So no, Montana rubies would not qualify as pigeon blood. They're typically too high iron to um, have that fluorescence that you would expect from a pigeon blood ruby. Um, but also in terms of chemistry and inclusions, they are distinct from the Burmese ruby and also geology as well. They're quite different from Burmese rubies. They're, they're really very similar to the Montana sapphires themselves in terms of their inclusions and their chemistry. And it's sort of like you take an ordinary Montana sapphire, just add some chromium to it, and that's kind of what um, a Montana a ruby is. Okay, doc. All right. I think that's all we have time for. So, Nathan, if you want to go on to the next slide, um, this is what's going to be happening next week. So, I hope you'll join us, everybody. It's, it's going to be a fantastic talk furnaces, fluxes, and filling. Uh, a, ruby, a, a review of ruby treatment, and of course, uh, the fabulous Wim for Triest will be the speaker for that. So thanks everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Palkey and Nathan for a fantastic speech, uh, talk. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Robert.